Hi all, my name is Murat Stefane and um, here's my take on the question, is there something like a specific data visualization mindset? Uh, and if so, what is it like? You know, what unites us, what fascinates us as data viz practitioners? Or maybe conversely, if you have to work with like one exemplar of our peculiar species, uh, maybe it's helpful to understand what makes us tick, like why, why do we act so funny? Uh, and so uh, just in terms of background, I've been an independent data visualization expert or how I like to call it truth and beauty operator for over 15 years now. And I had the privilege to work with many organizations like World Economic Forum or OECD, uh, but also partners in academia, such as the Max Planck Society, or lately also companies like Salesforce, Airbnb, or the German railway, Deutsche Bahn, you know, and I helped them find truth and beauty in data. So that's my, my job, uh, self-picked self job. And uh, we can just, so that's a very fundamental talk if you, if you are in data risk, you might be like, oh, this is boring, but I want to start the basics. So we can start at the beginning and ask, why do we want to visualize data at all, right? And um, well, the typical answer is, for starters, we're surrounded by an increasingly number heavy world, right? And numbers alone are hard to consume. And so they require our full cognitive attention to like, you know, parse all the numbers and figure out what they mean. And it's very hard to get like the big picture just by consuming a lot of little pieces, right? And so here you see four different data sets. They all have different values for X and Y. So the yellow data set, purple data set, blue data set. And luckily we have summary statistics, right? So the statistician will tell you, ah, oh, it's easy. We take the mean, we take the variance, we take the correlation and look at it. All these data sets are pretty much identical or ex actually exactly identical if we look at them through the statistical lens, right? And so uh, from that zoomed out view, it, it looks all the same. Now, the exciting thing is when we bring visualization into play, we can see that all these data sets are not identical at all. And here the Gestalt, you know, Stefan mentioned came, comes into play. We can see they have their own shape, their own nature, their own structure. And so only the data visualization allows us to the, the forest, like the big level statistics and the trees, like the little individual data points at the same time and the form they have together, which is amazing, I think. And so I think that only seeing the data like this allows us to really think about what's the nature of the data, where did it come from? What's the process behind it? You know, can I understand the causal mechanisms behind it? So that's really the power of data visualization, seeing patterns and seeing trees and forests at the same time. Do we harness this potential? Um, well, often in companies, I see these types of dashboards and it's basically just huge numbers. And there's a little like chart decoration around it, like to make it look nicer, like, little circle or an icon. <laughs> and so I like to call this exercise number decoration. You know, it seems to be a whole job to just decorate numbers basically. And uh, my feeling is we don't really see much patterns here. It's really just glorified numbers. And maybe again, if we think about uh, Stefan's talk, this idea that just the measurement alone will tell us the truth, but it takes the human out of the loop. You know, we're just responding to one dimensional signals, right? And so then you complain, say like, hey, I want to see all the little trees, you know, but then you get these applications with like 10,000 filters and drop downs where really nobody knows their way around and you're just overwhelmed with all the options and all the possibilities. So that's the other extreme. This is the, here's all the data, good luck approach, you know? And so th these are two things I really see. And, and I think if we think about what can data visualization practitioners bring, it's exactly not falling into these two traps, but really, crafting data heavy applications fit to purpose and make them work really well in a given context to answer specific questions, allow for specific insights. And this can never happen off the shelf or like be repeated exactly the same way again and again, but it needs to take the domain and the, the, the nature of the data and everything into account. So it's always a process, never one shot thing or not easy to reproduce. I think this, this crafting to purpose and I like to think about the problem a lot also from a language point of view, because from my perspective, sense making with data and changing your mind with data really requires to think about the language we use and the languages we invent. And only new languages can also create new data cultures, right? And so, um, so if you want to change how we work with data, I think you also need to come with new visual languages or new forms to represent them. And so that's just preamble where I'm coming from.
high level, like this, this is my approach. And now let's dive into these things that make up to me the state of his mindset. So I isolated five points. I go through them. You don't have to learn the bar right now. We'll walk through them point by point. So, but these are all things where I found like, ah, these are recurring issues, you know, this again and again, the things that I think a lot about and that I think make good data visualization work at the end. First one, uh, worlds, not stories. So reality is really complex and multi-layered. And often people tell you a good visualization tells you a story, you know, it needs to have a story. What's the story? And uh, I like to say excellent data visualization actually tells a thousand stories but not all at once, right? And I think that's a trap if we always ask, but what question does it answer? You know, you're asking for a simple Q and A, like a single problem solution response, but I think great data visualization does much more. It, it lays out a whole world to you. And uh, let me give you an example. So the OECD Better Life Index, uh, I was commissioned to do that together with the agency Raureif in Berlin, I think eight or nine years ago already. So it's, a, it's a, almost a, a classic maybe. Um, and the idea was to find a new visualization form for the OECD Better Life Index. And the interesting thing about that is the OECD is typically known for putting out really big books with many tables and charts, usually blue or gray. Um, they, they do the PISA ranking, you know, and all rankings, country ranking here, country ranking there, it's all pretty dry and, and like statistical, let's say. Um, and now we came up with this visual, which is like totally different for, for what they were used to. And it came also out of a context that they wanted to question traditional ranking paradigms, right? Because um, the idea of the Better Life Index is maybe there are many aspects to what constitutes a good life. And traditionally, if you just looked at one of them or just at hard measures like GDP or employment figures to compare countries, um, nowadays, people would look more for like health, happiness, sustainability, and especially how these things come together, right? Or how they in, in sync or disconnect, right? So we're thinking a bit more multidimensional about the world and they wanted to reflect that. So um, we came up with this visual and now said, oh, there could be a flower for each country and the length of all these individual flower petals could indicate the scores in one of these dimensions. So it's a very multidimensional thought. And we move away from just comparing individual rankings to more this overall shape of a country. Um, the other thing is to bring in personalization and interaction. So everybody has different views and preferences. And that's why on this website, you can experiment with different weightings of the data right on the page. So you can say, what happens if I like crank up civic engagement, right? And Sweden, Australia rise to the top or let's bring income into the mix, right? And then, oh, United States and Luxembourg catch up, right? And so you can see this interplay between action and results, like action and reaction, and just probe that pretty high dimensional data space in a very like playful way. And without even realizing you're doing super complex linear algebra actually in your browser, right? But you, you think you're just testing and seeing what happens. So it's a very playful way and a very like simple way to present this actually quite complex um, data set. So um, I think what made this data visualization really work is exactly this idea that was multidimensional, very unique, characteristic, iconic, maybe uh, playful and personal. And, I think that's something if you always chase the simple story that you wouldn't come up with. And uh, for the OECD, it was actually a big thing in the sense that it was a small data visualization project. So it started as a formal exercise. Hey, we would want to visualize this data, but these flowers became sort of an expression of the whole new view of the organization and really a shift in mindset triggered by this visual model, this visual idea, which is uh, kind of interesting. I think that this can happen in a way. And now all the new cool like data viz projects here done by Interactive Things from Zurich are sort of presented against that backdrop of the Better Life Index, which I sort of like a lot in a way. Um, so this idea, um, think about like, how can we show complexity, <clears throat> but make it digestible, give it structure. You can't just throw stuff at people, right? and um, allow for this personal perspective, but you can still be the tour guide as a designer basically, and sort of prepare good paths, but sort of leave it open to um, do your own thing in a way. I think that's, that's often successful. Second point, um, making things graspable, tangible, and altogether more easily to digest. I think that's something Stephanie does really, really well, like find a human angle into like a big topic 
and make it just yeah fit in one hand basically <laughs> uh, or like make it directly experiential um it's also something i've been experimenting with for instance with uh, Susanne yashko um we explore in the data cuisine workshop series if food can actually be a medium for data and that's obviously something very rich and very personal um and we investigate can it be a data visualization medium right and so to find that out, we team up with local chefs and local workshop participants in different cities and try to tell local data stories through local food. And it's a two-day workshop, and at the beginning, we first like scan other interesting data stories that can be told about the place. People bring their own data or you know find something, and then they sort of brainstorm um, ideas like how could we transform these data ideas into dishes. And then we actually cook them. So we always rent a kitchen and have a chef usually um, who helps participants with like really cooking techniques and then people present them nicely. And the actual visualization happens at the end when there's a data dinner or a buffet where we all taste the creations and sort of talk about them. So the visualizations are not the photos you see, which are of course nicely styled and nicely annotated, but the actual experience is of course live in that moment in that group, right? That's, that's when it happens basically. And just to give you a sense what comes out of that, so here's gin and tonics that indicate the number of uh, participant, uh, inhabitants close to a nuclear power plant in Belgium and the way it's presented with like black light and these little like, uh, like um, liquid nitrogen smoke, you know, it evokes obviously cooling rods from nuclear uh, power stations uh, or reactors. So you have that feeling of being in the reactor almost. Um, here participants <clears throat> talked about the food themselves so they thought about is the food very local or does it have to travel very far to get to us so this tapioca banana leaf thing you know had to travel to basically half around the world to even get to the workshop so they placed it proportionally in a distance from the participants so this was basically in the next room you know they had to, they had to walk there to get it um Here's a dessert from Switzerland where there was a big like uh, bee uh, colony collapse problem. So a lot of the bees have died. And so the participants there asked, maybe we have to do the bees jobs one day. And so this dish is unfinished when you get it and you have to finish it yourself because the bee didn't complete the pollination process. That's something you have to do yourself, sort of enact it. And yeah, some topics are also a bit more Bittersweet, as you can see in this death by chocolate prelinase, uh, which visualized the statistics uh, of the causes of death in Belgium in the form of small coffins. And Aline Bird, the designer, she made one per participant in the workshop. And basically, it's a lottery among the participants to draw their cause of death, right? Everybody receives one of these coffins, and the fillings are distributed statistically how it would be across the population in Belgium. So I think it's a very smart way to think about probabilities and risks and lotteries right in that context uh, and also a very striking presentation of course um yeah so these are very small data sets as you can see they take a long time to present basically it's just a bunch of numbers we work on on them for two days and you know it's very laborious obviously um but at the same time it's very memorable and, and really what stephanie also mentioned this idea that it's a catalyst for debate and engagement in the sense that you consume it together and you have suddenly an object you can talk about and, and start to think and not end. Yeah? I think that's, that's very powerful about the whole approach. And again, this idea to bring things at human scale and to specific places, I, I think that can be very powerful. You can say, well, I can't always cook or, or dance perform the weekly sales numbers now, right? <laughs> but I think you can take that thought and sort of transfer it also into other contexts, like just a little hint there. So I, I, I was working on the German COVID-19 vaccination dashboard last year, and we really tried to present the basic facts about vaccination, really understand in a mobile first, simple way. So in a way, it's also total opposite of data cuisine, you know, it's like straight up, like dry, here are the facts. Um, and, but that also included showing the same information from different perspectives, you know, and because we want to make sure people get everything, like the important stuff. And so you have to say it in different ways. And for instance, we, we talk about the number of doses applied per day, like here in March uh, uh, last year, it was like 107,000 uh, per day, not very much. Um, 
And that's a precise but quite abstract number. And at the time when it like the campaign just started, people were like, is that much? Is it not? You know, who knows? And so what we put on the website is another way to look at the same data. It's a little clock that tells you basically how much people are vaccinated right now if they were vaccinated evenly across the whole day, the whole 24 hours. So it's a bit hypothetical, but it gives you a sense of, okay, what's the, the, the gut feeling of the speed? Is it faster than yesterday or not? Or is it actually way? And for some people, the large number works better because they have good relation with like, oh, I know how much there is. I know how many people live in Germany. So it's, I can do all the math. And for other people, it's more like, oh, I want to see the clock. And I know yesterday the clock was a bit slower and I'm happy that it's sped up. So doing the same thing twice, but like in different ways can be, can be quite, quite helpful there. So that's the graspability thing, rich, essential experiences, bring things to human scale. Uh, and really connect to everyday experience. I think when that succeeds, it's, it's always, always a plus, even in, in like professional context or complex situations. Um, next to piles are actually more maybe about designing tools for the individualization, maybe. Um, so the first two were very communication heavy and how to make things stick and memorable and draw people in. Uh, but I also do a lot of like tools to, for people to work with data or figure things out. So. And to me, this connection between design and code is very important. So the way I design is very closely connected to the way I code. It's often not easy to separate the two actually. And as, to me, that also has to do because, so here you see these basic building blocks of data graphics, right? So we have marks, we have channels, things and their properties. And to me at the heart of data visualization is really the thought that we actually design systems that map data to these perceptual channels. Uh, channels, right? And if that's what's happening, right, then we have to realize that we're not designing images, but we're actually designing languages, rule sets, systems, right? So it, it, it's generative by design. It, it can still result in a single image, but you have to think about what's the rule behind creating that image. Why do, do I do things that way, right? It can't be all arbitrary. Otherwise, it's, it's something else than data is. And to me, then, that means, oh, code is actually a good medium to do that because code is all about rules and languages, right? And so, um, but I still think a lot about also what's a good visual metaphor um, that people will get, you know, and that's the other part of the language. Um, Pick spotting is a good example. Uh, so that's the tool we're working with, uh, with uh, Deutsche Bahn, like the German railway to help people understand how passengers flow through the system and where trains are too full or too empty. And um, here's one of the very first slides I showed them where I said, we need to think about what's fundamentally happening here and what could be a good visual language for that, right? And so these are very basic thoughts about, okay, trains are things, they have a fixed size, right? And then there's little passengers, which we don't like, or too many, which we absolutely don't like because that's a big problem. And then there's a sweet spot in the middle, right? And so. Um, before I even start about what graphs you should do, I was thinking like, how do we use color? How do we use lengths? How do we use areas? What, what Lego blocks can I now, you know, lay out before me and then work with them and assemble meaning? And again, it's not a pretty slide, but that's where the, this whole thought process started. And then starting from that, you can sort of, by exploring data and prototyping, iteratively work with that language and see what that language in combination with the data can tell you and what you can discover, right? And we basically bootstrap the whole like complex data application just based on these design ideas and then ex active exploration of data, prototyping. And once we knew, oh, that's a principle that works, then you can go into refinement and building the application and testing it properly. But you need to have a principle and, and like a design idea, right? That works. And, and I think that has a lot to do with are the rules consistent and understandable. Yeah, and so and then it turned into this um, basically, yeah, over many years used very intensely application. There were more applications we're now building on top of it, um, but it all started with this simple, simple thought about trains being like containers and uh, fill levels of these containers being like qualities we want to talk about in, in color and so on. And so you can see sort of pulled through the whole application, the sing super simple design idea actually. Um, yeah, and of course, prototyping. The other part of that, and this is what I learned a lot about in this project, is not just be data inspired. Uh, 
And as Stefan has mentioned, we can just think about what, what the data can tell us, uh, but also what people need, right? And so um, we made this really a parallel activity in this project to always explore the data and the user side of things. And we, for instance, looked very closely at what's the user's work situation, what do they want to achieve, what are the other tools they're using, it's a big mess, obviously. And also, especially we looked at what do they do in paper, and I think that's always the most revealing part and the most interesting one. And because that tells us where the gaps in the software are, right? And so here we saw people are marking like uh, with text marker like trains on these really complex diagrams, but they were totally comfortable with them. And so we knew, ah, oh, we can take what they do in paper and put it into a prototype, test it, and move it into the application. It's something they're familiar with and they can work with and which they like, you know? And so it's a bit, yeah, it's all a discovery there in terms of, hey, what's, what's the jargon people are used to or what, what can we transfer into the digital world? Um, the other thing we do quite a bit is also visualize and analyze user behaviors. So um, we use visualization to understand how people do visualize, uh, use our visualization. And so um, we saw in this extra tool that people were searching a lot, like we built this complex data visualization, but people, some people were just using the search box and the result list. And so we said, that's fine. So we built a little, uh, spotty search engine extra like search engine just for trains <laughs> because they don't need a complex uh, visualization but we would never have known if we hadn't like you know looked under the hood and and visualized the usage patterns of our application anyway so yeah i think that's that's interesting to bring these two worlds together and also observe when they're in clash or when it fits together i think that's something where Often the rubber hits the road. It's like, what do people want? What can the data tell us? This is where it gets, gets tough and challenging, but also rewarding. Um, last very short point is, is the relation of truth and data. And I think that's, that's something we sometimes tend to forget is that uh, no data is, is really absolutely perfect. All data is incomplete, biased, imperfect. Uh, but still, and I think that's super important too, some data is still better than others, right? It's not everything is like a postmodern mess. It's like there is good science, there's mediocre science, and there's really bad science. So let's, let's also be clear about that. And I think as data visualization experts, we have to think a lot of like journalists in the sense that we just have to care about showing the right perspective. And what that is, nobody can do that job for us to figure that out. We have to do it ourselves by, by learning and asking and researching. Um, and I think in terms of role models, I think we should look towards journalists, not salespeople or entertainers or engineers, but really what's the truth and do our visuals help shed light on the truth. And I'm a huge fan of Scott McCloud. So he has these visual comics explaining how comics work. Um, and at some point he talks about panels in comics, like the literal frame of an image, right? And he says, this panel frame is the device by which you can grab the reader by the shoulder, guide them to the right spot, um, tell them you're here and now look there, right? So it's this very powerful thing of just positioning people, giving them a specific perspective, and then just have it unfold, right? And think if that works, it's just beautiful. And um, that's what we should all strive for um, in the end. But you have to show them the right thing, right? And so here we are. These are my five points. What's the stories? Make it graspable. Design is code. Code is design. Be data inspired, but also user centered. And favor truth over data. That's it from me. <laughs>